Thank you. Thank you for the very nice introduction. Um, let me first congratulate ATV with their 75th year anniversary. I look very much forward to getting through this one and to the 100th anniversary. And I appreciate the invitation to come here and try to uh, summarize some of the key points you have heard today. When I accepted the invitation, I thought it would be pretty easy, but now I'm not so convinced. Uh, but let me do my best. So uh, during the whole day, I have tried to put together a few slides to uh, recap some of the things you heard. And uh, I submitted them to the ATV office yesterday. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, therefore, uh, my presentation is uh, focused on trying to give you a Danish uh, perspective on the different talks you've heard today. And I have chosen the title Sustainable Growth at Innovation Square. It might not make any sense to you whatsoever now. It might at the end of the presentation, at least when I got to the end of my presentation myself, I was, I was really pleased with this title. So uh, let me try to make some sense out of that. I think one thing we learned today is that innovation is a pretty important thing. And uh, this is actually one of my favorite quotes because it uh, emphasizes something which is really, really important. The only sustainable competitive advantage is innovation. It sounds trivial, but it's not. The only way you can maintain sustainable competitiveness, a lasting competitive advantage, is by constantly innovating. And I'll come back to that later, but that will be the red thread in my talk. So even though there might not have been a red thread in my career, but at least I hope I can maintain a red thread in my talk. When I prepared the talk today, I, I like to include this quote here, uh, because I think from all the speakers today, you all learned that we will see a lot of change. I think, uh, it was said that change will be even faster than it was before. And uh, if you have to find a good quote to talk about change from, I think this could be one. It's not the strongest of species that survive, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that is most adaptable to change. And as I said, I prepared this yesterday evening. But after listening to the presentations today, actually I think that maybe if you look at just one species, or the type of species that is here today, actually the one that will survive is maybe the one that drives change, because if you only adapt to change, you, I don't think, will come out of, as a winner in uh, tomorrow's world. So let me come back to that later. When I talk about innovation, it's really important to put that in a proper context, because I think in Denmark we have a tendency to uh, talk about things, and we tend to agree, but then we didn't actually define in the beginning what we talked about, and then I think it makes little sense. When I talk about innovation, imagination, fantasy, and creativity, I talk about three very, very, very different things. I think that when you talk about fantasy, that is the ability to get new ideas. When you talk about creativity, it's about getting new and useful ideas. And when you talk about innovation, it's about getting new, useful, and implemented ideas or implementing ideas. And often, when you mess around with these things, you don't get the main point about innovation is that Really, it's about implementation, and that is a key point. If we look at Denmark, for a long time, we have been talking about Denmark as a knowledge society. But I think maybe in the whole way we talk about that, that has been a mistake. But we, because we don't have to be a knowledge society to compete in tomorrow's world, we need to be an innovation society. And I think actually the Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation said that very clearly today. And there's a big difference in the way we talk about things. Being a knowledge society, you can be very, very knowledgeable, but very, very, very poor. But I think actually the target for us should be to become an innovation society, and that's a, that has a big influence on how we should do things. So I think the whole setting that we have been talking into has been slightly misleading to some of us, at least to me, and I think really let's stress the innovation things. Because I think in Denmark, we have a lot of fantasy. I think many, many people in Danish society, they get new ideas all the time. They always get ideas. All the people I work with in my many different jobs throughout my career at universities, at large, uh, large enterprises, at small enterprises, I have met a lot of fantasy. Actually, I have met a little less creativity, but I still think that I have met 
lots of creative people. What I haven't met so much of is actually innovative people. And I think there's a big difference. And if you look at this in an international context, and I'll come back to that later, we are very, very good at these things. We need to get better here. And I think that's also an angle that ATV has pursued over the last years. Earlier this year, there was a meeting about innovative courage and why we don't get as much innovation in Denmark as we could have. So to try to say a few words about what is the local challenge, this is just two slides I picked to illustrate that. First of all, I think, as it was pointed out by Paul Krogsgaard Larsen this morning, it was also pointed out by the Minister of Science, Education and, and uh, Technology, that we actually do very well in science. I think it's undisputable fact that if you look at all key performance indicators for how we perform in science, we do very well. As you all know, we have also increased the funding to uh, research from two point, yeah, you can see the number here yourself, so that we now comply with the Barcelona targets. And you can say, is that, is that a small amount or, or a large amount? I think you can compare to other countries here. It's more than they spend in the US. It's less than they spend in Korea. It's less than they spend in Sweden. But the fact is that actually we are among the countries in the world that spend most money on research. 1% of GDP in the public sector and 2% of GDP in the private sector. And so first of all, we spend quite a lot. We know that we get quite a lot of good science out of that. Actually, uh, if you look at the quality of the science per spent uh, euro, krona, or dollar, or per spent capita, we do very, very well. If you look at the growth rates of various countries, I think the local challenge is really that we do very, very well in science, but it does not translate into economic growth. And I think actually that's a phenomenon you'll see many places in Europe. And here we can compare growth rates for different countries. There's no surprise to you. I think the Minister of Science, Education and Technology said it earlier today, or higher education, said it very well earlier today. So this is the local challenge. We do well in science, but it does not translate into economic growth. I think throughout the day, you have heard about some global challenges. I talked a little about the local challenge, but now let's talk about some of the global challenges. In many of the talks earlier today, uh, you heard about some of the global challenges, and I borrowed this slide from Professor Biesenbach. I thought that possibly somebody today would talk about global challenges. We have heard about food production. We have heard about water resources. We have heard about energy. We have heard about health. We have heard about climate. We have heard about minerals. And uh, we have heard about the big driver for all this going from seven to nine or 10 billion people on this planet. And I think it's pretty obvious that when we face all these global challenges that we have all heard about today, grand challenges, grand societal challenges, I think it's pretty obvious that they represent an opportunity. Obviously, you can always discuss if this is mostly a threat or it's mostly an opportunity. And uh, this is also a discussion you've heard today. But I think solving some of these or contributing to solving some of these, that could be a very nice way of solving also the local challenge of, uh, of uh, growth. And when we talk about this, I think it has, was also touched upon by Paul Kors-Kollarsen earlier today, we need to be careful with our terms, and that's also a discussion you heard today, a basic science, strategic science, applied science, non-applicable applied science, all these terms that we tend to use uh, more or less randomly. For me, they don't make too much sense. I think many people have said the same thing today. For me, uh, when a researcher says, I'm doing basic science, what I hear is, we heard about communication also earlier today. When, I, when a researcher says, I do basic science, it typically means I don't want to spend time on figuring out if it can be used for something. If he says, I'm doing applied science, it means uh, this is useful for obvious reasons. And if he says, I'm doing strategic research, it says it just means uh, somebody else is saying that this is important. Actually, I, I think about science from my experience in both universities and industry in different terms. I don't know if it's too useful. But what you should realize is that the way you create growth is by doing better than you did yesterday. And the way you create growth from science is not by doing research. It's by doing research, I'll come back to that later, and then out of that research, you generate a business idea, and that business idea is brought to a market as an improved product, an improved service, an improved process. And that is the value creation. The value creation is only when you get a business idea out of your research or your research ideas. And industries are really, really good at that. 
most of the industries I know of that are doing, uh, that are research-based industries, they use the same model more or less to bring their business ideas to the market. That's called a stage gate model. And uh, most of you know about this. It will be you can generate in your organization or outside your organization, you generate 100 business ideas. Then you take them through a stage gate and you sieve out the ones that are most promising and then you kill, or park or redefine the ones that were not so promising. And typically, I learned for chemical companies, it takes about the order of 100 business ideas to generate one product that is introduced to the market. So this is, this is the thing that we do in industry. We are very, very good at that. We have elaborate models to take us efficiently from the business idea to the market. And uh, interestingly, this approach has been refined over the last 60 years, basically. And the interesting thing is that this approach is becoming more and more, uh, 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 the, the approach is being adapted into universities to a larger, larger extent. And I think that's really, really a dangerous thing because in universities you don't develop product uh, mostly. I think in private industries you will spend 80% of your resources here and then you will spend 20% of your resources here to develop knowledge or capacity to get business ideas. And I think we should be careful not to confuse the two, but I think we also need to emphasize that the link between this world or this thinking, which I will call uh, divergent research, I will call this convergent research for obvious reasons, the link between the two is actually the business idea. We are good at Den in Denmark at generating research ideas, do brilliant research, but we are not sufficiently good at generating business ideas out of our research. And I think uh, it was also mentioned earlier today that it does not have to be, uh, at the, uh, you don't have to compromise scientific quality to get relevance. So this is expressed in Pasteur's quadrant as you have here. And uh, you have seen it before. All of you, I just want to emphasize that, uh, that in Pasteur's quadrant you can do research that has high fundamental uh, uh, ambitions or uh, ambitions for fundamental understanding and at the same time you can have uses uh, in your mind and several speakers elaborated briefly on that today and I think that was a really important message that you don't have to have one or the other, you can actually have both at the same time. You saw several examples of that. So I'm not saying that if you talk about research, I think we have to be careful not to say we need this or that, but we need to shift a balance in Denmark. And in my view, we, we need a little less of this. This is the type of research where we understand things in more detail. We understand, understand in more detail, and you can probably see the example. We need to shift the balance slightly from understanding everything in great detail, maybe even making uh, criticism of existing approaches, and then we need to have more of that type of research where we actually try to translate our understanding into solutions. And that's something that you have also heard several times today. Obviously, the universities play a key role in this. And for the last year, I've been interested in trying to talk about this in a consistent way and uh, in a collaboration between the Danish Council for Research Policy and the Academy of Technical Sciences. We have talked about how we can actually do more in this area. And I think the important thing here is that actually we do very, very well in this value stream here at universities, I touched about it. But for industries, often this value stream here, the education, the probably educated candidates, that's the most important thing to get from universities for the industries. And also with this value stream here where we have patents, collaboration, dissemination, that is actually the most efficient way of translating the knowledge from the research into societal value. And I think we need to get many things out of this. I don't want to be simple-minded about it. We need to have something to live from. We have something to live for, and we have something to live with. And I think it's a delicate balance to get all of that. But we simply have too little of this today. And uh, the way you can actually change that balance is, of course, you shouldn't do it by compromising this. But maybe you should move efforts that only give value here and make lower priority to those and give higher priorities to those that create value both in the education of people and in the knowledge transfer to the, uh, to the society. So I think with this simple model in, in place or in, in your mind, you can actually try to refocus or reprioritize some of your efforts 
So you get more value in all three value streams rather than getting a little less here and a little more here because I don't think that's the way forward. We shouldn't compromise this, but we need to make sure that all the quality we have here is translated as efficiently as we can into these two value streams that are actually the most important for society. I think that also uh, uh, gives us an opportunity to, to uh, revisit this famous quote, a society's competitive advantage will come not from how well its schools teach the multiplication and periodic tables, but from how well they stimulate imagination and creativity. And I think, again, this is, a, this is an old quote, as you can see, but I think actually some of the things that we are saying here today, and I think several speakers have stressed that, is that this is really the interesting thing. And in Denmark, I think, maybe we have focused too much on teaching the multiplication and periodic tables, but too little on this. And again, it's not either or. I think actually you can, by stimulating imagination and creativity, you can al also motivate students to learn more about the multiplication tables and the periodic tables. So it, again, don't go for the either or. You can have both and if you want. And just to, uh, to try to explain my title is actually, we have talked about in Europe for a long time and in Denmark about a knowledge triangle. And the knowledge triangle is, uh, if you take, do some research, you do some in, in education, then you will get some innovation. That is kind of the thinking we have. That is the thinking behind the Barcelona target. I, li I like the Barcelona target a lot because it has helped us lift the investments in science. But, but to be perfectly honest, it's, a, it's, it's not maybe the optimal target. Is it a target for society to spend 3% on R&D? Or should you maybe look more into what do we want to get out of it? If you could get the same things out of it by spending 1.5%, you should obviously do that. And I think that is a very good example of how we think too much about input and too little about output. And I think we have seen that there is no power in the knowledge triangle because universities, they are very, very good at building capacity. But to take that capacity and translate it into solutions, which I'll come back to later, business is the best place to do that. So a very, very simple thing, which I think you can say again and again and again, is that you, this knowledge triangle is really meaningless. What is important, that we call it an innovation square, where the interaction between business, research at businesses, research at universities, education, I think there's much more power in it. And therefore, I think that we need to really rethink if we do this the best possible way. I think we can do many things better in this area, and we'll come back to that later. And I, I think that's one of the Paul points that Paul Krosko Larsen made earlier today about learning about which inventions are important is pretty, a pretty good point, because if you want to think out of the box, which I hear that many colleagues want to do, we would like to do out of the box thinking, I think it's a little easier to do that if you know what is already inside the box. And I think that is actually what Paul Krosko Larsen said earlier today. And to know what is inside the box, that is actually we often we need to go to the businesses to learn that. And when I say businesses here, it could also be the public sector because we don't need innovation only in the private sector. We definitely also need innovation in the public sector. And that could also make us get much more value out of some of the, the, the research that is not technical science or natural science. I think there's a great place for humanities and social sciences to actually contribute value directly into the public sector. So if uh, I need to sum, try to sum these things up in uh, three simple recommendations, I think we really need to rethink if we want to be a knowledge society or we need to be an innovation society. And I think we need to look carefully at our whole education system and figure out how we can systematically foster and nurture innovation throughout the education system. And I think, uh, I think actually one of, uh, in Professor Nelson's talk, there was this point about the Brussels approach, the West Coast approach, the East Coast approach. And to me, it was kind of an eye opener in the sense that in Europe, we, we, we stop before we ever start. When we talk about nanoscience, a discussion that many of us have been involved in, suddenly all the, discussion about was, all the discussions were about the dangers. The discussions were, shouldn't we have a national center to study nanotoxicology, and that was before we had even one application in Denmark. So I think, uh, I think actually we need to rethink this, and it has to start in school, but it also has to penetrate into high schools, and it also needs to penetrate more into universities. I think actually maybe we should start at universities. Then I think that many speakers today have made a point out of solving global challenges. 
will require technological breakthroughs, actually major technological breakthroughs. And I think that, as I said in the beginning, doing this actually represents a significant local growth driver. And I think that means we should increase our focus on providing solutions and not on understanding the problem. Again, it's a balance that should be shifted. And in Denmark, you know, we have had a long discussion about should we pick the challenges or should we pick the winners? I think actually we should guide the rising stars. It means that we talk about smart growth, we want green growth. To be honest, I would be happy if we just had some growth. But here in Denmark and in Europe, we are so clever that we only want to go for the smart growth and the others can do the stupid growth, or we only want the green growth. I think actually, when we look at the numbers for Europe and not least the prognosis for Europe, we're not going to have any growth whatsoever. So let us just start to focus on the growth. And I think rather than picking one idea, investing in one idea because it's green or purple or smart or stupid, let's, let's just invest in the best ideas. I don't think we have that many, so I think this is actually a more important point that we could make to make sure that we end in the, in the maybe in the Midwest approach, I don't know, uh, rather than the Brussels approach. So, it has also been emphasized today that the path from research idea to innovation is not a linear process. It's a highly uh, stochastic process. And uh, I think uh, all my experience from universities and from industry says that this is a very, very complicated thing. It is definitely not linear. But again, if you need to do out-of-the-box thinking, you need to know what is inside the box. And you need to engineer the interface between businesses, public sector, and education uh, system much more clever or explore that much in a much more clever way. And the obvious thing to say is, of course, that we should try to increase the circulation of creative people between the public and the private sector. I don't think we have been tremendously successful about uh, to do that uh, in Denmark, and I don't know what the, what the, how we should do it, but that's the reason we have some experts here who can provide some advice on how we can foster or if we can stimulate that maybe later. So to come back to... Uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to this, I think the key point is that innovation is important. It's not about creativity or imagination. It's not about adapting to change. It's about driving change. It's about driving innovation, not, uh, not about uh, understanding everything in more detail. So these would be my recommendations based on what I've heard today. Thank you for your attention.